Welcome to Old and New, our show about aging gracefully. Tonight, I've got Adam Sand with me, my co-host. How are you doing? Great to be here. Excited about the topic. It's going to be good tonight. It's oh, yeah. about med tech. It's even broader, though, as a subject. We might talk about seniors' health care, robotics, monitoring their health, oh. getting stronger and healthier, how technology is going to change everything about 50 to 100 years old. Our favorite journey here at Old and New, yes? So far, so good. Okay. Yeah, yeah so, no, I like the topic. This sounds fun. We've got two great guests. I'm going to tell you first, my guest, a local Boston, really, she's just famous, honestly, because she is the person who knows, truly, the most about social media and healthcare that I, person I've met. So she has been, and the, it's not a mystery, I'll tell you her name, it's Carissa. I had a feeling. Caramanis O'Brien, and you probably have met Carissa before. But Carissa has been at Phillips Healthcare at Aetna. She has been at uh, W2O. She has her own company now. She's the president of Red Box Communications. But I want to hear about the other guest, and you know who that is. So tell us who else sure. is coming on tonight. Uh, well, excited about Carissa, and also excited we're going to be joined by Iggy Fanlow. And Iggy has uh, a history in med tech. He actually founded a company that a lot of people might have heard of called Lively. And uh, these days, he's got a new effort that I think he's going to tell us a little bit about. It's called rdata.us. Okay. Is he here in Boston? Well, he's our Skype interview. Excellent. And he's out in San Francisco. So, uh, yeah, um, he's got some connections to the local area. Okay, well, enough boring stuff by us. Let's see these guys. Let's hear what they have to say. I think we'll go first to Carissa, and then we'll talk with Amy. You good? Good to go? Yeah, looking forward to okay, it. Okay, let's do it. Hey, we're back, and I've got the greatest guest today. Hi, Carissa. Hi, it's a bit of Carissa Caramanis O'Brien is here with us today to talk about something she knows more than anyone around social media and healthcare. Mm -hmm. And in today's show, Old and News about seniors, we want to ask her some questions. But first, I'm going to give you some background things I've looked up, some research I did that I found pretty surprising. So, for instance, by 2020, 40% of all Americans will be 50 years old or older. Mm -hmm. So we're going to really be looking at that community needing health care and technology in ways that other generations have not needed. We'll, we'll need to create solutions for that group. And then here's a Facebook, you're, you'll know about this, Facebook fact that I found pretty interesting that just in 2013, Adults 65 and over on Facebook were 45% of the community. But within one year, by 2014, it was 56%. So it is growing at leaps and bounds. So um, can you give me just a sense of what you think is going on with seniors and social media and health? Yeah, so you want to tackle that last topic first? Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think it's an exciting trend. It's an interesting one when we look at um, where it's come just in the last few years. You know, we know uh, wholly 35% of seniors are now actively using social media on a regular basis. And those that are active are using it to connect with members of their personal networks on a daily or near daily basis. So they've become one of the most engaged populations in social media. And that's not just Facebook alone, but um, but also sort of the broader um, set of social media and social tools. Um, we're seeing a lot of seniors embracing online communities, and that includes, you know, online communities for health. Um, so it's really an exciting trend. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's one of the sharpest uh, growth trajectories for any, you know, sort of subpopulation that uh, the research looks at. Um, and it really, I think, is a, is a telling statistic for those um, in the industry that serve the senior population, but yeah. also, you know, those that um, that care uh, for perhaps senior members of their family um, to be sort of aware of that increasing use and how they're using it and why. Right. Uh, we know that more and more seniors are using 
their phones and they have smartphones and there is some great research that was done at Pew. They asked um, younger people and older people, did they consider their smartphone something that was a leash or something that gave them freedom? So 82% of the smartphone owning seniors said it was a freedom, it was an item of freedom. Mm -hmm. And it was the 18 to 29 year olds who said it was a leash, yep. which I thought was, <laughs> yeah. wouldn't you think it would be the other way? Well, it's or, funny, I, I think it's it's sort of around the, the use model for each of those populations. <laughs> so for the younger uh, group, they saw it as a leash because they're thinking of it as a device that connects them more, like, more than likely to work. Yes. Right, so it's a leash that keeps them, for better or worse, connected to their daily obligations, their work life, um, and perhaps keeps them maybe a little disconnected from mm -hmm. the other more, more enjoyable aspects of life. For seniors, because their smartphone use tends to be more narrow in, um, you know, they're using it for more often those more pleasurable connections, whether it might be their increasing use of social media, um, staying in touch with their grandkids, things mm -hmm. like that, um, or perhaps for improving some of the things like you know managing their own health care, things like that, um, they see it as a connecting tool. So they, they saw it both as, uh, I think the words that the study showed were connecting and, and freeing or liberating. Right. That they, they associated those, um, sent, you know, those feelings and emotions with smartphones rather than that that leash that maybe those of us in the younger population sometimes feel. I'm gonna ask you about that, that device. Yeah. Are they ready for seniors? Mm -hmm. Do they, I see people looking at the tiny print, I mm -hmm. see people trying to find a button they can't find. Yeah. Is that gonna ever change? I think it, it will, it has to. And I think okay. some companies are certainly, um, you know, starting to broach design factor and um, and usability and understanding from a senior perspective how some of those things need to change to make it more usable for the senior population, the aging population. Um, so, you know, we see certain things like apps that um, increase text size and um, tablets that are designed, you know, specific, specifically for an aging population, things like RealPad and GrandPad and some of these devices that are, you know, designed with seniors in mind. And I think the important thing is you know, there's the there's a lot of uh, potential, um, you know, money to be made in this increasing, um, you know, the cr increasing opportunity around the aging population, right. and so a lot of companies are going to rush into the space. But that that strategy and design and production has to ha keep the senior in mind right. and very central to the design. Otherwise, it's it's going to be among those that fail. Right. I think you probably know when we talk about community, we've talked about this on Old and New before, that it is the connection to community is um, always associated with healthier and long living mm -hmm. seniors, that they get certain benefits from that community that um, are hard to underestimate. They're apparently really a, a foundation of health and yeah. longevity. Mm -hmm. Have you read on that subject? And yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see it with um, you know examples like patients like me that have you know really disease specific um, online communities, right. and those aren't you know certainly aren't for seniors only, but um, there's certainly an engaged patient population of the you know 50 plus, 65 plus um, nature that are engaging there more in their own healthcare. Um, you know, I think there's there's certainly other examples. You know, one organization that I'm uh, a part of um, on the board of directors for the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Foundation, and so um, we have a, a patient, uh, our survivor network, I should say, and there's a very active community of 50 plus survivors and family members of either survivors or those who have, who have lost a family member to cardiac arrest, and that population is incredibly active in the just the anecdotes that we hear about the, the sense of connectedness right. and the, the ability to tap resources that they wouldn't otherwise be able to find so readily and, and through you know, connections across the country and even globally, mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, they're certainly seeing a lot of value in, in that, that sense of community online. That's great. 
I know there's some things that sound almost sci-fi and like <laughs> out there and crazy, but um, as I was reading more and more, there are things like these, like the idea of a robot, we need to stop thinking of it as something that's going to either steal our jobs or is <laughs> from an old Star Wars movie, right? right? So yeah. can you give us an idea of what robotic mm -hmm. can mean mm -hmm. with technology and health mm -hmm. and seniors and caring for people? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a good point as far as the, you know, folks start to get that big brother mentality, like, you know, our robot's going to come in and replace our human caregivers. And, you know, I certainly don't think that that is uh, very likely, particularly in the U.S. market, where it culturally wouldn't be very accepted. But there are certainly some models where it's proven to be effective and it's being tested in various ways. We think first of the you know more broader use in the Asian countries, so yes. Japan, um, Singapore, which has you know one of the larger um, aging populations. Um, you know they're using it for a lot of you know mobility um, issues where you know they need um, assistance mm -hmm. to augment human care. Um, uh, but you know there there are tests being done here domestically. There's some hospitals in San Francisco that are using um, robotic aids for you know simple patient tasks and mm -hmm. um, medication adherence and things like that. So there's certainly you know some models there that that make sense. Well, now you got me excited and interested, and I have to say <laughs> we have to stop. So that <laughs> always works here this way. So thank you so much, and we will. Uh, put more and more stuff up online around this show because mm -hmm. this is going to bring up so many interesting issues. Sure. And I hope you'll be back sometime. Thank I you. I'd love to. Thank you. Thanks, Hallie. I'm really excited about our next guest. His name is Iggy Fanlow. Iggy, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Adam. Good to hear from you. Yeah, good. Thanks so much for joining us. Let me just say a couple of words and we'll get into it. Um, so some of you may know Iggy. Um, he was co-founder and CEO of a company called Lively. Uh, that company was sold in 2015. And right now it's a little bit under the radar, but I think we'll get to it later. Uh, he's the founder of ourdata.us. So Iggy, right off the top, I mean, what, what interests you about this space, this whole med tech uh, area that we're talking about tonight? Yeah, it goes back a long, long way. Um, I was actually uh, going to go to med school. I had been accepted and was going to go and worked at a hospital uh, for a, a good chunk of my uh, last years in college. And quite frankly, I was highly disillusioned by what I saw. Uh, and so I pursued a completely different career path in finance and then technology. Uh, but after 30 years uh, after my graduation, or not quite 30 years after my graduation, um, I said, you know what, I'm going to try it again. And, and, and I guess I was fortunate enough to be successful. And as one of my mentors told me, you've been successful. It's now time to be significant. And uh, doing something in healthcare was something I wanted to do. That's really cool. So I, I think I alluded to that transition that you made after 30 years um, talk to us a little bit about Lively and, and what uh, the company uh, wanted to accomplish. Yeah, so we, we looked at the health space. We kind of looked at the intersection of two things. One was large and growing markets and the intersection of that with in, in healthcare, within the healthcare verticals and uh, areas that most founders, certainly here in Silicon Valley, had uh, ignored. And when you looked at that Venn diagram, uh, the intersection aging kind of jumped off the page. And so we said, hey, what can we do in aging? And, and we looked at a lot of the services and products out there. And, and what we found was, uh, was pretty sad, actually. The, the products were, were uh, clunky. They were demeaning. They were expensive. Uh, they were hard to implement. Uh, and, and, and we said, you yeah, know, we could do it better. Uh, and, you know, Apple kind of leads the way in terms of making beautiful products that people want to use, not products they have to use. And so we looked at products, and you, I'm sure you guys have heard of the commercial. This is the way we, we got to it was, uh, help, I fall and I can't get up. And, you know, that's an iconic commercial. Probably almost everyone over the age of 35 or 90% of the people over 35 have, have seen or heard of that commercial. So it's got a huge brand image, but yet at the same time, it has 
really negative connotations uh, about hel helplessness and old age and uh, independent living. And it just puts a really a terrible pall and a bad feeling about all of those things. And so we said, how, how do we make it better? How do we build something that people actually want? Right. So that, that was the beginning of, of Lively. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you actually, uh, that's how I first, I guess we all saw MedTech um, was through uh, Help I Fall and I Can't Get Up. I mean, late night TV. Uh, so talk about where you went in terms of form factor, because I, I, that, that never made sense to me. You're, you're pulling a cord, you're reaching for your phone. What was the innovation and, and where, uh, I guess, in wearables? Yeah, we, 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 you know, we did see the success of things like Fitbit and, and other wearables. Uh, we had heard about the Apple uh, Watch that was in kind of a not-so-secret beta or uh, alpha for several years. And we, we went and then spoke to you know, uh, hundreds of elderly folks. We showed them several products, several form factors. And we also found that that was the, the age group that actually wore watches the most. So people in their the millennials in their 20s, 30s generally don't wear watches. They get their time from, uh, from their iPhones or from their uh, Android phones. And so we saw these older folks wearing these. We showed them the, the current pendant product. Um, and, and when we talked to them about the pendant product, what they said to us was, you know, that's the one my kids buy me, but I would never wear that dog collar. I would never wear that garage door opener. So that was the, the feeling people had about it. It just screamed that you were old, that you were incapable, that you were, uh, you know, uh, somehow incapacitated. And so we said, why don't we make something that people actually want to wear as opposed to need to wear? And so that, that's really one of the insights I would give to any entrepreneur looking at just about any product or service, you know, we always try to say, let's fill a need. And I say, that's interesting, but irrelevant. What you need to do is create or fill a want. And people are going to go after products and compete, re continue to reuse or engage with products they want, not they need. Uh, that, that totally makes sense. It, it actually brings up sort of a marketing issue that you probably faced along the way. Um, I'm guessing a lot of these people don't even want to be identified as old. So there's sort of a stigma attached to the, the, even the word old. So what, what kind of steps did you take in that regard? Yeah, we, we really, actually, it's funny. We, we did a lot of research about what words make sense, elderly, elders, older adults, and, and really none of them are good. Uh, the least bad one was older adults. Um, but the, the, the key, I think the key insight we came to is no one wants to be identified as old. So when we built the, the product, we said, let's build a product that doesn't really, the, 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 the value proposition isn't just about emergencies. So we again look to the model of the iPhone. I mean, people call it the iPhone, but, you know, sort of tongue in cheek here in the Valley, we call it, or in the Bay Area, we call it the everything but the iPhone. And then what ends up happening is here's a product, and I have one with me, obviously, here. And you, you do call it a phone, but it's probably the fourth, fifth, or sixth utility you use on it. You text, you surf, uh, you uh, take notes, you, you, know, you have 10 apps you use, Facebook, other things. Oh, and then you actually also use it to call people. And so we did the same thing with our product. We said, let's make it a watch. So that's something you're going to engage with several times a day, maybe even 10 times a day. We're going to make it a step counter. You'll look at that a couple times a day. And then the statistics show you're, you're going to hit the emergency button once you're in your 70s or 80s, about every couple of years. So we said, here's a product you're going to engage with thousands of times before you need it for emergency. So it, has, it checks the box in terms of emergency features, but that's not really the driving force. We wanted something very elegant, something very beautiful. In fact, our early beta testers refused to tell their friends and family that it was an emergency watch. They, for the people were asking them if they were a beta tester for the Apple Watch. Right. That, that uh, makes a lot of sense. And yeah, they, they were the innovators, absolutely. And it'd be kind of hard to have two watches on at the same time. So yeah, I'm <laughs> mm -hmm. glad, you, glad you guys got there first. Um, yeah. I guess, you, you know, you talked a lot about Lively. What other trends are you seeing out there uh, in terms of uh, communications between 
uh, patients and doctors and between family members and uh, older uh, people mm -hmm. in the family? Well, the, the good news is they're tied. Um, and the, the, the revolution in healthcare will really be around data and when people start to really begin to share their data and the results that will come from that, from everyone or from a large group uh, sharing their data. And that leads to our new venture, ourdata.us. It's a consumer data union. We feel people should be paid for their data. Uh, that's the fair trade-off. It shouldn't just be content or free services for data. It should be people paid because you're capturing a lot, whether it's browsing, health, financial, otherwise. So that's where I think things are headed. This was great. I can't thank you enough. I mean, a, a great overview of uh, what you've been up to the last few years and uh, what we can all anticipate coming down the pike. So thanks again. I appreciate you being on the show. Thanks, Adam. We're just about done, and I've got three takeaways. First, Carissa knows everything about social media and her suggestions for seniors to stay in touch, use social media, learn from it, share your own personal experiences, whether they're about fitness or family or fun. This will keep you healthy. In terms of med tech, connection is everything. My second takeaway, is that Iggy brought us into a world of amazing research on what works best for how to talk to older adults. Notice I say older. His research showed that nobody wants to be considered old. If you're going to make a product for seniors, do the kind of deep research he did. It was so interesting. And third, easy takeaway, I went in thinking med tech was just some certain limited area where technology and medicine work together. Like maybe it makes it easier for you to order pills online. Well, I found out it's much more broad. It includes so many things. You might have a robot help lift you in and out of a hospital bed within 10 to 15 years. You might find med tech means lots of simple problems when you have to get to a doctor and go home from a doctor are gone when you're using your doctor's excellent advice via Skype. MedTech will be an amazing boon for older people, I almost said seniors, but make sure you keep up with it, read about it, learn about it, and I hope we will do more shows on it because it's pretty fascinating. Thanks for watching.